Hi, I'm John Davidson, lead pastor at Evangel Temple. Thank you so much for tuning into the message today. I hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you. If it is, leave us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoy this message from God's Word today. If you've spent any time with me, you would know that I love to ask the question, why? Students will come up to me and ask me a question. I'll say, well, why do you think that? I remember I used to ask my mom tons of why questions. I would ask her, why is the sky blue? Why are we doing this today? Uh, why can't I be a mermaid as an occupation? So I asked her all these questions as I became a teenager, my questions got a bit sassier of why do I have to do what you tell me? Uh, why do we have to do this today? Because I don't want to. And into adulthood, my why questions have switched to deeper questions like the one we're asking today. Today we're looking at the question, why would a good God allow suffering? Man, that's a, that is a heavy question that I'm sure everyone here in the room has wrestled with. I know that I have asked this question as well. All of us have experienced suffering. Maybe you have an illness in your body and you're experiencing suffering in that way. Or maybe you've experienced the loss of a loved one, a financial problem, a divorce, whatever kind of suffering you've experienced, you're not alone. I think of our Evangel University family who this week lost an incredible professor, Dr. Renee Griffith Grantham, who tragically lost her life two weeks ago at the age of 34. I think of the suffering that's happening to the people in Ukraine and the Middle East. Whatever kind of suffering, whether personal, local, or global, this question begins to arise in us. Why God? Are you really good? Do you care about me? Are you there in my pain? I wonder if maybe there's someone in the room today and you've never accepted Jesus as your savior because of this question. You say, I just can't reconcile an all good and all powerful God with the issue of evil and suffering. Well, I want you to know that you're not alone in your question. The theme of suffering is woven throughout scripture. In fact, it's one of the central themes of scripture. The people of Israel wrestle with this question. The psalmist over and over and over again asks God, God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? And the books of Job and Ecclesiastes are dedicated to exploring the question of unjust suffering. Jeremiah, one of my favorite books of the Bible, explores the way evil seems to rule the land. Jeremiah, a man of God, has to deal with the evil of his own people and the consequences and fallout of that. And Jesus is the ultimate example of suffering as a man of sorrow, a man who committed no sin. A common conclusion of suffering is this. If God were all good, he would destroy evil. If God were all powerful, he could destroy evil. Since evil has not been destroyed, there is no all good, all powerful God. No matter what worldview you subscribe to, you have to answer the question of suffering. You have to answer the question of pain in the world. So how do, how do other worldviews do this? Well, a Hindu would say that suffering is a result of karmic debt. It's car whatever happens to you is a result of something that you did, or it's something that you did in a past life, and you're dealing with the pain of that today. A Buddhist would say it's because of your attachment to this world. While I was preparing for this message, I read of one Buddhist who every night when he tucks his son into bed and he kisses him goodnight, he thinks to himself, one day my son is going to die and I should not become too attached to him. You have to answer the question of suffering. Naturalists will call it bad luck, assigning it no meaning or purpose. Some theists view it as something ordained by God. Every single one of these views don't seem very helpful or hopeful. So what is the Christian worldview on suffering? How should we think about and process this in our own lives. Now, before we dive in today, I, I have to give you a disclaimer. We don't fully know. I don't know why that thing happened to you. I don't know why you're walking through what you're walking through. I can't answer for that for you. No one can. But what I do know 
is that today I can provide a framework for you, and this framework will give you something to process the question of suffering and to also give as a response when someone asks you, why would a good God allow suffering? I know, also know that the, a framework for suffering will never remove the pain. It won't, it won't make the loss hurt less. It won't make you grieve less. And it won't fix the problem. Sin and pain and evil will always hurt us for as long as we live. Today, I'm not trying to explain away all your issues or tell you to just get through it and trust God. This is going to help us understand how to think about suffering. So how do we answer this? Again, the answer isn't going to fix all the problems, but it's going to help us tackle this question from a logical viewpoint. I also want to mention that when someone is in the depths of suffering— and they're dealing with a deep pain and deep loss, telling them the logical reasons for suffering is not helpful. It is not going to help them. What you can do when someone is dealing with a deep pain and deep loss is tell them this. I'm so sorry that this happened to you. Then you just sit and say nothing else. The greatest gift that you can give to people in the midst of their grief is your presence. People need you to just sit with them, weep with them. Often as Christians, we try to explain away suffering or make sure God doesn't look like a bad guy. But in the meantime, we give answers to people or responses to people that are unhelpful and hurtful. For example, some dear friends of mine over 10 years ago gave birth to a stillborn. And just a few days after this devastating loss, a Christian came to them and said, the reason they're walking through what they're walking through is because of sin in their life. That's not kind or helpful or true. Maybe you've also heard someone tell you during pain to just count your blessings. I know things are really hard right now, but just think about all that God's done for you. Just make a list. Write down all the blessings that God's provided for you. Or maybe when you lost a loved one, they look at you and say, well, God just needed another angel. God doesn't need another angel. None of these answers are helpful to someone walking through suffering. Again, next time you're with someone who's dealing with pain, just sit with them. They don't need a logical explanation. They don't need you to explain away their pain. Maybe once the dust has settled, then you can begin to address the logical reason for suffering, which is this. Suffering exists because we have free will. Free will is the ability to choose. You can choose to follow God, or you can choose to do your own thing. In Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, God gives Adam and Eve a choice. There's two trees, the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God tells them this in Genesis 2. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So the devil comes in the form of a serpent and he convinces Eve to eat from the tree, persuading her that God was holding out on her. And he says, God knows that your eyes will be opened As soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The devil tempted Eve with the power to be like God, which would enable her to go her own way without trusting God. Adam also chose to eat the fruit, knowing he was going against God's command. When they ate from the tree, Adam and Eve decided to take the power of good and evil into their own hands rather than trust God. Through that decision, humankind broke relationship with God and brought imperfection into the perfect world that God made. God had protected his people from evil and death, but in choosing to step out from God's protection, where they enjoyed eternal life, Adam and Eve brought death and suffering to the world for the first time. You might be thinking, Pastor Abby, then why would God put the tree in the garden in the first place? Great question. It's because God wanted to give humanity the opportunity to choose. He wasn't looking for a rock or a robot to follow him, but for us to choose him because of our love for him. 
God didn't want his love for us to be something forced, but genuine. You could go to your phone today and say, hey Siri, tell me you love me. And Siri would say, I love you. And when you do that, it's not going to warm your heart. It's not going to make you feel so good and so great. Why? Because you forced it to say, I love you. But when you come home at the end of the workday and your child runs up to you and tells you they love you, or a friend puts their arm around you and tells you how much they mean to you, that grips your heart. Why? Because they don't have to do that. They don't have to. Love is so much more meaningful when it's not forced or coerced. The problem is for us that to have free will, to have the ability to choose, we can choose to love God, but we also get the choice of evil. And when we choose evil, we choose sin, which always leads to suffering. So we ask if God could be good and still allow evil to happen, he would also have to take away our ability to choose. Now, this doesn't mean God is distant or doesn't care. Actually, it's the exact opposite. Because of his great love for us, suffering isn't evidence of a lack of love. Parents in the room, you understand this. When your kid runs out into the middle of the street and you yell at them, it's not because you don't love them. It's actually because of your great love for your child that you get on to them because you don't want them to get hurt. God deeply loves us. Do you know what else is amazing about God's love for us? It's that God has a plan for redemption and suffering. When sin and pain entered our world and created pain and confusion, and since God is loving and powerful, he must have a solution for this mess. I don't know if some days you look at the world or listen to the news, you're like, man, this world is a mess. Well, I have good news for you because God has a plan for redemption. God intervened by providing the answer for sin and death when he sent his perfect and sinless son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. You may be familiar with John 3, 16 through 17. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God sacrificed his own son. Let his his own son go through suffering for us. Jesus suffered. The perfect man, the only perfect man to ever live, suffered on your behalf. And that's not the end of God's plan for redemption. In Revelations, we learn that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Maybe you've been watching the news and you've seen the tornadoes that are devastating America. Maybe you've seen news about earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes. The earth is groaning for the Lord. The earth is groaning to be united with the Lord. And Revelation tells us there will one day be a new heaven and new earth. It also tells us this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying, or pain. All of these things will be gone forever. The pain that you walked in with today, the illness that you walked in with today, the deep hurt that maybe you experienced years ago that you walked in with today will be no more. The Lord is coming to redeem the suffering that we're facing The pain you experience will be no more, but we're not there yet. We still have to experience the evil of this world. In the summer of 2020, I was home with my family who live in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, It's my mom, my stepdad, Carl, my brother, Will, and then my youngest brother, Galen. It was July 22nd, the day before my brother, Galen, was going to turn 17. And I woke up at 1 a.m. to cries from my mom. And I ran out of my room to find my brother Will performing CPR on Galen. And I began to perform CPR on Galen until the ambulance came. And minutes later, he was pronounced dead. 
Galen's passing was unexpected and, of course, deeply painful. And in moments like that, it's easy for us to ask, God, how could you be good? There's no way you can be good in this. God, you have to be distant. God, you don't care about me. I've been a Christian since I was five years old. I've served the Lord. I've grown up in church. How could you do this to me, a good Christian? It's easy to think that God must not be good in moments like that. I remember spending the days that followed sitting in my room weeping as friends and family came and went offering condolences and prayers, meals, and their tears. And church, I want you to know that in the midst of my darkest moment, God's presence was so tangible. There was a peace that passed all understanding, even in the mix, midst of my mourning, even in the midst of my darkest moment, God was so present with me in my pain. C.S. Lewis writes, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. I can't tell you why Galen passed away so young. I can't tell you why the thing that happened to you has happened to you. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. I don't know why that person did that thing to you. But what I do know today is that God loves you so much. And that God meets us in our pain. He cares deeply about you. And he wants to meet you today in your suffering. In Psalm 13, the psalmist says to the Lord, Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Maybe you've asked God the same question before. How long will you forget me forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eye or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying, we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. The psalmist here expresses his deep hurt to the Lord. And I want you to know, church, you can do the same thing with the Lord. Growing up, I felt like I, like I wasn't allowed to tell God the hard things. I could just come to God and be like, hello, God, I love you so much. Thank you for all the things. And I can never truly be honest with him. But that's not at all what we see in scripture. We see the psalmist here be honest with the Lord and say, God, where are you in this mess? There's anguish in my soul. Where are you? But then the psalmist goes on to say, but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. The psalmist just got done expressing how, how frustrated he is, how he feels like God is distant, but then he ends it with, I will trust because he is good to me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. I can't answer for you why, but what I do know is when you walk with Jesus, he will begin to comfort you. He will begin to meet you in your grief and your suffering. And somehow he gives you a peace that doesn't make any sense. And in any given moment, he may not feel good. And he may, not fe and he may feel distant. But when you walk with Jesus over a lifetime, you will see that he is faithful and that he is good. He is good. One of the other things I love about the Lord is that he redeems everything. When you follow the Lord, he redeems it all. Our family's life verse is Romans 8, 28. My mom would have this sticky, no had sticky notes around her house with this verse in our bathroom. There were five people, one bathroom. She had sticky notes of this verse. This week, my mom was actually in town and she gave me a brand new Bible. And before she gave me the Bible, she highlighted this verse for me, Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love Christ and are called according to his purpose. We know that all things, if you're in the Lord, the good of those who love Christ, all things work together for good. He redeems it all. When you follow the Lord, two years ago, I was at youth camp and the speaker asked the youth pastors to line the altar. 
And the speaker began to ask students to come forward. They said, find your youth pastor and pray with them about what's going on. And this girl came to me. I'd never met her before. She was not in our youth group. And she began weeping. And she said, I feel like God isn't there. I feel like God doesn't care about me. I feel like he, he doesn't notice me. And I said, why do you feel like that? And she said, well, right before I got to youth camp, my youngest brother passed away. And I got to look at her in the moment and tell you, man, I want you to know today that God is not distant and God sees you because of out of all the people in this room, you came to me who understands what you're walking through. And I can pray with you and link arms with you. God redeemed something broken in my life and used it to help this girl. God makes it all right. And it didn't take away the pain of losing my brother. It didn't remove the grief. But man, God redeemed that moment and used it for his glory and his goodness. Because that's what our Father does. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. I don't know what you walked in with today. I don't know what brokenness or suffering you walked in with today. But what I do know is that Jesus wants to meet you. Thanks again for watching the service today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to leave a note in the comments and let us know what you thought about the message, we'd love that. And if you're ever in the Springfield, Missouri area on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you join us for church. You can attend our 8 a.m. classic service, or you can join us for church at 9.30 or 11.